This is the first town hall that the conference has ever done. For some reason, I picked the straw that got this assignment. A little challenging, but certainly something I'm gonna give my all. And the title of it is Getting to Equal and Beyond. Okay, Getting to Equal and Beyond. That's a big idea, big subject. I'm gonna be laser focused on that subject in this conversation with all of you. You'll notice there's no one else up here. This discussion, I wanna underscore, which I said to Anita, not a referendum on our politics, not a referendum on a Senate confirmation hearing, although that is a backdrop to the conversation. It's about how do we get to a fair and equal society, and how is that an idea that is not a pipe dream, but actually becomes a reality? And the one thing I wanna underscore is something we say at Ariel all the time where I work, and I didn't even introduce myself, I'm Melody Hobson from Ariel Investments, is that we're not here to admire the problem. We're here to actually find solutions to it. That is the goal. So we want to, in this discussion, use each other to delve into best practices, ideas, things that are working, maybe things that haven't worked before, and come away with things that we can actually do in our individual organizations and do it with a sense of urgency. And I will invite participation of particular members of the audience who've already been pre-selected, some others that I know who have some opinions or work in this area, and then call on people along the way. So we're gonna start with a simple opening question Maybe you'll call it an icebreaker, I don't know, but we're gonna bring the town hall to order. And here's the first question. Should, in the context of all that we know over the last 27 years, just a show of hands, should Clarence Thomas have been confirmed? For those who say yes, just raise your hand. Should he have been confirmed? I'm not looking. <laughs> Someone said they're not voting? Oh, I'm not looking, she's not looking. Okay, so that's. Should Brett Kavanaugh be confirmed? Wow. Okay, we have some hands, so thank you for being brave and speaking your truth, and your truth is what is important to you, so there's no judgment about that. There are some people who think that he should be. I wanted that backdrop just as a context for the discussion. I said it's not to wallow in that conversation, but I do think it's the elephant in the room, and so we may as well get that one out of the way as we start and think about actual concrete ideas. And so getting to the ideas, I wanna call on Tassanda Duckett. Tassanda is the CEO of the Commercial Bank at JP Morgan, she's a star there. And she has been the one pushing some very big efforts inside of JP Morgan, first around women, and it's called Women on the Move. Yep. So T, as she likes to be called, <laughs> T, can you give us a sense of what is that all about? Yeah, so Women on the Move started in 2013, and it was really about the most senior women at the firm saying, how do we support other women at all levels around the globe? And so what started as just an idea has now reached a point that we're doubling down on that effort. So what does that mean practically? If you look at the outcomes, you notice that we have two female board directors, Melody being one of them at J.P. Morgan Chase, and Linda being the second. Um, Jamie's senior operating committee is 50% female, and I think what's great about it, it's the head of technology, the head of asset management, the general counsel, the head of HR. And then when you look across the firm, you see CEOs like myself running the consumer bank, and you see a CEO of CARD as a female. And so that is about the intentionality in recognizing that we've made progress, but we, not, we do not yet have sustainability because there's still more work to do. We so what are you actually, what's the so goal? So let's talk about a, a the target goal. that you're Well, the goal for? is we want 50% at all levels um, in, in terms of where we want to be. But let me give practical nuggets because you've talked about that. And I think this applies not just for women on the move, but it, it applies to African Americans and other minorities. One, I think it's about intentional leadership. It starts at the top. Jamie has been very clear about it. And it's not just when you're in front of women or when you're in front of other minority groups. It's in your shareholders letter. So that's one. Two, I think it's also about recognizing the progress. So yes, yeah, celebrate the progress, but don't let progress become your BAU. Because if you stop at the BAU, you'll never get momentum and you'll never get sustainability. I think third, it's a belief that no one gets a pass. A lot of times we can say that there are certain industries or sectors that we just can't do it because they don't exist. No one gets a pass, which is why I love what Miss Anita Hill said, process matters. Here's a stat, Melody, for females. 
if there's only one, we talk a lot about diverse slates, if there's only one female on a slate, the likelihood of that female getting hired is next to none. You add two women on the slate 79 times, that increases. So why is that? It's because when there's only one, you start to manage to the difference, and a lot of times when you see difference, you see risk. The fourth piece is getting beyond diversity and inclusion as solely being a human capital agenda or social responsibility. I think we have to decide that it's a business imperative. Why? Because when it's a business imperative, you ask different questions. You ask the question, you ask the question, what's the job to get done? What are the problems getting in the way? Who's gonna be assigned to it? Who is the owner? So we have a woman named Sam who's leading women on the move. We have a gentleman from the CIB, Sekou, who now reports directly to me, running Advancing Black Pathways across the firm. And the last thing, when I talked about deciding, it is about outcomes. We are what we measure at any company. We can no longer be soft about it. It can't just be saying, let's make progress. We have to say, what do we want the outcome to be? And how do we measure it? Individual scorecards, measure it over time, and be relentless about the problem until you achieve the outcome you desire. So Those what does are my it mean? tips. I have to ask one question, yep. T. What does it mean when you say no one gets a pass? No one gets a pass. What I mean by that is take an industry that there's not a lot of females or not a lot of African Americans. And we will say, I just can't find a talented African American. So what happens to you so if you don't So then what happens is we say, we start to admire the problem. It would be nice if. And so then what we need to do, if this was the way we attacked any business problem, we would get to the root cause. And we will say, why? And then what we may do is say, well, then we'll start at the beginning. We'll hire a 1,000 interns. Or we'll start looking at different ecosystems. Or we'll start to acknowledge how many of us majored in things that is not what we're leading, which means you can't follow the traditional path. You have to look elsewhere in order to find the talent. So I want to ask the room. I've been, this no one gets a pass question, I've been really anchored on because it seems in everything else that we do, when no one gets a pass, it's tied to pay. I mean, that's just the way it works. If you didn't produce the product in time, you didn't sell to the client, there's a direct, the, if the, 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 the uh, new program didn't come out in time, there's a correlation to pay, stock price, all of those things. But in this area, that typically is not the case. Does anyone here have an incentive plan where diversity is an actual component of it. Yes. Hi, Melody. Elaine Hi. Leavenworth at yes, Abbott. Yes, of course. Miles did it t 20 years ago when he became CEO. We linked it to pay. And if you were the ones that every month at staff, the numbers went up on the board. If you were lagging, you got lots of scrutiny. And at the end of the year, if your numbers, if you didn't make the numbers for, and it was all by grade, minority inclusion, female inclusion, et cetera, if you didn't make your numbers and show the progress that was set for you, you didn't get part of your bonus. Could you be a superstar in everything else and fail in that area and Absolutely. still feel it? You got dinged. And Question. was there pushback on it? You know, no. I mean, really? everybody got it. I mean, you know. Because they had to? It was forced? It was the culture that, you know, it was time to get it right. Anyone else have a incentive related to diversity inside of their company. Yes. Hi, Letha Reddy with Prudential. We uh, recently tied long-term compensation uh, to our progress on diversity goals, so for the senior most folks at our firm. And how has that gone over? Uh, well, it was fully supported by our board of directors and our C-suite leadership uh, who understood the statement we were trying to make about that, and the senior leaders understood it as well, that same kind of point, that we need to put a sense of urgency behind this and, and really make some progress and have the impact you want to see, not just the activities. Has anyone considered it inside of their company and then rejected it? Thinking the punitive way may not be the best way to get an outcome? Okay, well, let's stay on the subject of pay. So pay equality is something we talk a lot about when it comes to gender equality. And gender equality as a concept I think is actually giant. And pay equality is some, a, a place where you can be very, very specific. So I'm going to bring Cindy Robbins into the conversation, who's from Salesforce.com. So Cindy is the president and chief people officer at Salesforce. I have heard this quote. I think it's Maya, Maya Angelou who says, show me who your friends are, and I'll tell you who you are. And someone said to me, show me your compensation, and I will tell you what kind of company you have. Mm -hmm. So inside of Salesforce, you and a colleague yes. appealed to Mark we did. to look at pay by gender. Yes, three years ago. 
What so happened? Three, so three years ago, uh, a colleague of mine and a good friend, personal friend of mine, Layla Seca, she's a product executive at Salesforce. Her and I uh, had also recently been promoted, and we wanted to do more inherently in the company, specifically around women. And we had been talking about equal pay for a very long period of time. And I had a meeting coming up with Mark, because I reported to Mark, and I brought Layla into the discussion. I did not preset an agenda, and because most of my one-on-ones are quite frankly just conversations. And we spoke up around equal pay and a variety of other things, including maternity and paternity leave at the time. And he asked some questions around it. He wanted to understand, uh, his first question was, do we have a problem? And I said to him, I don't know if we have a problem, but we've never done this. We have never done this type of assessment. We should be doing it, but there are two things that we need to align on. Number one, we can't do it, see a big dollar sign, look under the hood, and then walk away, right? Because we're afraid of that number. And number two, we don't just do it once. We do it every single year. This is now part of the DNA of our culture. And, you know... Was he, it a hard sell? No, he listened and he said, go do it, right? He said, go do it. And I think this... So we've done it now three times. It's equated to about $9 million. And I think there's two surprising things that I always get asked, specifically the second year we did it and then the third year we did it, which is it's the same questions. One, why'd you do it again, right? And two, why'd you have to pay again? And here's the thing, actually doing it, we all have the data, right? We all have systems of record, we all have employee data. There's no excuse for us not looking at it and not doing the analysis and not doing what's the right thing to do there. And I think um, for us, that's, that's really the easy part. The hard part is sometimes that data exposes some gaps. And for us, it was our job architecture. It was looking at our compensation structure. It was uh, exposing some process areas. For example, one year we did the largest M&A. We acquired 14 companies in one year. And we acquire their technology, we acquire their people, but we also acquire their pay practices, right? And that's not to say they're, they're wrong, but now they're part of Salesforce, and we need to ensure that we're paying them fairly. So I could hear a general counsel saying, wow, this could expose us to some lawsuits. She's right back there, I, actually. I, <laughs> I mean, I, it, it, would watching be, me. it would be a reasonable <laughs> thing to think about. Was that a concern? Putting you on the spot? <laughs> I, I'm regretting walking through the door now. <laughs> uh, yes, actually, it, it was one of these moments where Cindy and I spent a lot of time yes. together and talking about this. And it was one of these moments where, as a woman, I was so thrilled when I heard we were doing this. And as a general counsel, my first reaction was, I'm not sure that's such a great idea. Because we were, as Cindy said, we committed to doing it without having any idea what the scope mm -hmm. of the issue was. And Mark committed to it publicly and said we would say what the re results were. So it was nerve-wracking. We knew that we had to get it right, how it was structured. Um, it took a lot of work that first year to make sure that was done right. And as Cindy said, you know, we had to commit that we we're going to do this every single year. And Did the, all the emails go to you as privileged information so that it would I'm, stay in I'm not going to answer that <laughs> question. <It is> a, <laughs> I'm trying to get to practical applications. I learned that would to be copy my first her on everything. <laughs> okay, so you're, you're very, very, very careful. But needless to say, it was a great partnership. And uh, Cindy's leadership in this area has made a difference, I think, nationwide. Have other GCs called you to ask you about it? Definitely. Yeah, and what do you tell them? <laughs> um, I tell them they have to do it. We're past the time where you can say that this is too risky. Mm -hmm. The risk is in not doing mm -hmm. it. So yes. every, There's no excuse any longer for any company not to take this step. Do employees ask? <laughs> ask specifically. Like, have you done a pay equity study? I think we are a pretty transparent company. Okay, so they know what So they we make sure, they, okay. they know when we did it, they know the outcome of the yeah. assessment. There's a lot of communication to managers and so right. forth, so we're very transparent. So let's go, Cindy, thank you so much. Let's actually um, probe that question a little bit more. Are, is anyone in a situation where that is coming up as a question? Is it possible that will be an expectation of businesses, that that is just something you automatically do? Will a millennial think that's just normal? Here, we have a, a Vivian Hunt. 
we have an evidence base in the UK where we went two years ago from five companies who reported their gender pay gap to, with a legal mandate, 10,000. And millennials, for recruiting, are the absolute number one users of the database. They search by company and they search by job because they know it coming into the interview. So I think that's just one um, illustration of where, with more transparency for all companies, it makes us more resilient and, and prepared for risk because we're not hiding anything. And secondly, we know, just looking at the UK data, millennials care, and in fact, your employees care because they're the second most frequent searchers of the data set. First are recruits, and the second are your own employees. I have to give a plug for Vi Vivian because I found out she was a dame. She's knighted. <laughs> Is that cool? I never met a black woman knight. I think that is the coolest thing. I'm sorry to tell you, there's only one. <laughs> and listen, it's a start. We got a princess too. Okay, so here's my next question. Has anyone been in a situation where you were doing the gender equity study and you were getting rationalization around it. So pushback. The reason the women aren't making the same amount is they're not performing as well. Or have, have those conversations come up where you have to deal with the root cause of the bias as opposed to just the math? Because if you don't deal with the bias at some point, the math just becomes a recurring problem that you're correcting, not because you did 14 acquisitions, but because of other issues. Has that been an issue for anyone? I think we have a microphone right yeah, here. Yeah, we, we've done it probably for three or four years. And I think I'd be curious from Salesforce to get a perspective on, um, Cheryl, I'm sorry, thank you. Cheryl Palmer, Taylor Morrison Home Corporation. Um, on really how you conduct the study, because I don't know if it's rationalization, but we have certain functions where the women make more than men, certain that the men make more than women, and they we do go one step you know, below just understanding the gender equality, it's skill and experience and tenure. And so that has to be part of the dialogue. I think I'd be concerned from a GC standpoint, how do you, once you go through this equality dialogue, how do you create expectations with millennials that experience and skill has to go along with pay equality because it's almost becoming a generic conversation. So I would imagine there would be tenure considerations in the math. So if someone has had the job for one year versus five, there is a difference. In the company there. and outside of the company. Yeah, function. So it's complicated. It, it, is. it is. It can be. You're, I think when we first did this, we started with like a list of 20 different variables and then try to figure out which were the right variables. I mean, you're dealing with people's pay. So you have to make sure you're, it's thoughtful and you get it right. You know, and I think to your point, you know, you have to factor in location, job function. And when we look at sales, we have 32,000 plus employees. So our job architecture is very complex. Um, and the bigger the company, it can get more and more complex. All right, I want to move and pivot to one more subject. Wait, we have someone. Yes, I don't want to cut you off there. Hi, yes. thanks, Melody. Jane Fraser from City. Um, we uh, we've shared some of our experiences around this as we've just completed not only putting to everybody a scorecard for the third year in a row the the different metrics that are required around the uh, senior executive table on diversity of all kinds, um, but we've also just completed the pay equity globally um, and done something very similar. Um, where we've looked at every single level, every individual, taking into account these different factors. But the piece, we didn't want to miss the point. Um, and so we put everybody uh, through a um, unconscious bias training. I thought it was lovely the point about we've still got some conscious bias to tackle with in certain parts of the world more than others. Um, but the other piece we found has been critical is making this inclusive. And one of the most important programs we have is men advocating for women um, and men advocating for real change so that we don't make this a zero-sum game, but we really try and couch it as a win-win because we were starting to get a lot of backlash. We were starting to get resistance. There was dialogue around, is this anti-male or are we against having, uh, the, is there room for men in this company anymore? As part of it, you say, oh, for God's sake. <laughs> yes. 
but you've but you can't do that you've got to make it very inclusive and i think that's been the piece of how do you make this a win-win dialogue across the board has been fundamental to us beginning to move the needle the way we want to i'm so glad you brought up the men issue because one of the things that i have been pondering, and I'm sure a lot of people have, is one, how do we bring men into this conversation so that this is not just us talking about this issue? So Helena Morrissey, who started the 30% Club, some of you may know her. When she started the 30% Club in the UK to push for at least 30% of every publicly traded board in the UK having women on it, she went to two of the most powerful men in the UK, as she tells it, and she said to them, you own this. I'm actually just going to stand behind you, and this is going to be your issue. And in doing that, and basically telling them she was not taking no for an answer, and they were going to carry the charge, and she, as the woman, wasn't going to be the one beating the drum for women, she actually said she thought she was more effective, and that's how it got done. So our question is, how do we bring men into this conversation so it's not confrontational, that it is one where it is not a zero-sum game, but where everyone wins, but more importantly, where we also don't create a situation of unintended consequences. So I don't think I'm the only one who's now hearing people say, um, I'm not sure I should even hire a woman because what if you know, we're traveling in X, Y, or Z, or maybe I'll be accused of something, or I don't want to mentor a woman because I think it'll be uncomfortable because something might happen. Um, there's a fear now that is palpable what do we do about that? Does anyone have great ideas about how to assuage concerns there and be inclusive in this conversation? Um, this is Lorraine Harrington with Catalyst. Um, I first want to say that everything we've been talking about, I think, is um, totally appropriate. So we have um, training um, for executives on um, the MARC training that was just mentioned. Um, and also a, at a more broader level, I'll give you an example of Chevron. They've developed something called MARC teams, which are like lean-in circles for men, where not only do they give the training and the workshops, but you can also have those discussions at a, at a um, at a departmental, at a um, very confidential level, and help really uh, they, most men want to make a difference, but they don't know how, so we can give them the tools and we can help them do that. Is there or, oh, the potential for overkill? I mean, what I worry about also is now we hear diversity and inclusion so much that there's a little bit of an eye roll at times around this subject matter. How do we prevent that? Anyone have any ideas? Anything that's working inside of their companies to keep the subject alive and well as opposed to just alive? Two points. One on uh, what you're doing. It's Jennifer Morgan, SAP. Thank you, Patty. Can you stand up? Um, so we, we did something similar on the pay equity. And what was really interesting is of the, the people uh, and the group of people where we had the, the inequity that we couldn't explain, 30% were men. And I had an unconscious bias when we did the study that it would all be women. So I used that as an opportunity when we communicated it, right, to, to, to talk about it more broadly and make it more about why equality is important and we got a lot of people's attention. The second thing that I've done that seems to work is in many times we have women's leadership events where we talk about different, different topics. I changed them to leadership events and have invited men into those and we talk about a lot of the same things, um, maybe a little bit more intimate, but that kind of changes the tone as well where you're bringing people together, where we are inviting men into the conversation. Thank you. OK, I'm going to move to Teresa Gao. Teresa is the um, co-founder of Aspect Partners. She's in Silicon Valley. And this is the important hotbed of the creation of business in America. These companies get funded. Many of them survive and go public. Not many, but some. <laughs> and um, it's like where capitalism is born in some ways, but we know the money largely goes to men, and the people who make the decision are mostly all men. So you've tried to do something interesting, which I think is very relevant to this conversation, especially when it comes to not pushing people away, but bringing them in. You're trying to positively affect change through positive messages. So tell us exactly what you're doing. Right. So 
two things. Um, so one, just a little context in terms of the mostly men. Um, so when I co-founded the firm uh, with my partner Jennifer, we happened to be two women um, in a world where over 90% of venture capitalists, almost 95% are men. We instituted our own version of the Rooney Rule in build, building our team, and we made sure, and I guess T told me it should have been two, but we made sure we interviewed at least one male finalist for every person on our investment <laughs> team. Um, and, uh, and very proud to say our firm is now 50% male and 50% female, and more importantly, our companies are 40% female founders. We're not happy yet, that should also be 50. But so you can make change by, which all of you are doing by being here, being very visible and not being afraid to hold yourselves and everybody else to those same rules. And that, that cascades well, You've down. also moved away from, you don't want to shame anyone, but you want That's to highlight right. people who are doing, how are so, you doing so that? So the second part is um, through some organizations that I'm involved with, like All Rays and Founders for Change, you know, there's so much bad news about how Silicon Valley is terrible, it's a bro culture, startups are terrible. Some of that may be true in some places. So instead, we've decided to use things like All Rays and Founders for Change to tell very public stories in the media about P women who are being successful, and yes, all male firms who are deciding to hire for the first time female investing partners. And after the announcement of All Rays, we've gone out of our way to highlight firms like Andreessen Horowitz and Greylock, who have hired their first female partners for the first time, in some cases, in 25 plus years. So it's sort of positive reinforcement, and I would say it's sort of guilt by omission, because if you're not in those positive stories, then we know what that means. So how have you moved the needle in a very short time? Like I said, you know, the, the announcement of All Rays was uh, in, in April of this year, and since that time, there have literally been over a dozen, which is not a large number, but when you consider there's only a few hundred venture capital firms that are of any scale, you know, we've moved the needle from three quarters of the venture firms having no female investors to, you know, maybe now it's 60%. So we're, we're making change. Our goals are realistic. We want to double the number of women investors in the next 10 years, and we would love it to be sooner. But we, we measure that. We measure every week, every time someone gets announced in the industry, and also similarly uh, women who are getting funded, too, in venture capital. Do you think the Ellen Powell case had anything to do with it as well? Uh, I think, unfortunately, uh, so yes, but I think to your point about backlash, I think, unfortunately, I heard many people off the record saying, this is why we don't hire women. And, uh, and the really, so it was sort of the second shoe to drop. So that it was, it was weird. In, that was, I know exactly when it was, because when I founded my firm three, four years ago, and we didn't see as much change as I would have hoped. But I think actually the really, really bad behavior, because uh, then it wasn't just one place, it was sort of, you know, uh, binary capital and then five, you know, it's on and on, many firms. And finally, because the combination of it's the second shoe to drop, and I'd like to think that our strategy at All Rays of shining a positive light on good behavior made our male partners uh, in the industry want to step up and be on the good list, right? So we don't have to have a bad list, but by having a good list, we can shine a lot of light on that, and I think it really has made a difference. So as we close, this is what I heard. I heard that process makes culture from Anita Hill. I heard that pay can be fixed from Cindy at Salesforce. I heard that leadership for all can make a difference in not keeping people out and making them feel disenfranchised, specifically men, whose help we need to move the needle. I heard that if you're using the Rooney Rule, two, not one, makes a difference in terms of the outcome. And being positive can create its own change, especially if you can create a good list as opposed to a naughty list. Thank you very much for playing along. And hopefully we all got some great tips. Thank you.